turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. We're going through a very special series this Christmas season. One of the most wonderful things we do and one of the most important things we do at Christmas is to sing. And the series we're examining is explaining why we would do that. Why would we sing at Christmas? And if we love to sing at Christmas, why should we love it all the more? If we think it's important to sing at Christmas, why should we underline the importance of it? And one of the passages in Scripture that explains why we worship at Christmas, why we sing at Christmas, and not just why we sing at Christmas, but why we worship at Christmas, is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14, and this is what God says. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a son for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father, it's Christmas, and we're seeing a lot of things. In this place, at this moment, right now, would you show us Jesus? And would you fuel our worship? And would you fuel our singing? For the sake of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The last Christmas before I was a Christian, so it's the last Christmas I celebrated as a lost person. I was a freshman in a public high school, and I saw a pin on one of the teachers that as far as I know, it was the first time I had ever seen this pin. The pin was worn by the librarian at the school. Her name was, uh, was Mrs. Daniel, a dear, sweet woman who is uh, still with us and I still know and stay in contact with every now and then. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was a strong, committed Christian and she was wearing this pin. She wore it all the time and it said, Jesus is the reason for the season. Popular slogan, as long as, as far as I knew, that was the first time I had seen it. And there she was, a public school librarian, just daring anybody to tell her to take it off. (laughs) Just as bold as she could be. I now know that that's something that Christians say all the time. Jesus is the reason for the season. We believe it, and believing it, what do we do? Having believed that Jesus is the reason for the season, how do we celebrate it? Well, we do all sorts of things. There's all sorts of options as we celebrate Christmas together as people who know about Jesus. There's food, there are wreaths and Christmas trees, there's family get-togethers and church get-togethers, there's gifts and Santa Claus, there's fruitcake. There's all sorts of things that we do to celebrate Christmas as those who know that Jesus is the reason for the season. But if we really know it, if we really believe it, what will be the essence of our Christmas celebration? What will be the central thing that we do? Let me ask you to consider the answer to that question by considering angels and Jesus. Fascinating reality in the Bible. When Jesus 
and angels appear together, the angels have an instinct to do something in the Bible. We see a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus and angels. That is an appearance of Jesus before he was born in Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, the angels are described as seraphim, these burning ones. There is fire coming out of the angels. And in the presence of Jesus, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And at the sound of their worshiping thunderous voices, the temple shakes. That's Isaiah 6, before Jesus is born. You say, well, how do you know that that was Jesus? Well, if you read in John chapter 12 and verse 41, the apostle John quotes Isaiah chapter 6. And in verse 41, he said, Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And the he there is Jesus. Those burning angels were in the presence of Jesus and they worshiped. You see an appearance of angels and Jesus together after the birth and life and resurrection and ascension of Jesus in Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, we are granted a vision into the heavens where Jesus sits enthroned and we see the heavenly host surrounding him. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it says, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We see Jesus and angels together and there's worship. That's a pre incarnation view of Jesus and angels. It's a post-resurrection view of Jesus and angels. And today, in Luke chapter 2, we see the incarnational appearance of Jesus. We see the birth of Jesus, and it is accompanied by angels. And what do the angels do? The angels do what we see them do every time we see them responding to Jesus, and that is they worship Jesus. In verse 13, suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. You see the point. When you see angels together with Jesus, you see beings who have the good sense to respond in worship. They respond in worship, not just when Jesus is born, but when they're in his presence before he's born and when they're in his presence after he's resurrected. If we were going to take our cues about how to respond to Jesus and about how to respond to Jesus at Christmas, the angelic advice doesn't involve turkey or fruitcake or gatherings or trees. It involves worship. A great test of our heart about whether we see Jesus as he really is or whether we are going through the motions is whether when we see Jesus as he is, we do what the angels do. When we see Jesus, do we join the angels in worship or do we do something else? That's a great test of our heart at any point of our lives. It's a great test of our heart at Christmas time, particularly when Christmas Day falls on Sunday. We're all going to we're all going to get a test of our hearts and what we really think of Christmas and whether we really believe Jesus is the reason for the season when we see what we do on Christmas. This is 
This is showing up in my life as a bigger deal than I ever would have thought it to be because I had some interaction with a pastor this week who pastors another church in a different state. And he was interacting with a blog I wrote about how Christians ought to come to church on Christmas Sunday. And he said, uh, we're not doing that at my church. And I was like, really? No kidding. Now, I'm not the Lord of anybody's life. I can't make you do anything. I certainly can't make uh, a pastor in a different state do anything. But I just thought that's really interesting that a Christian pastor would use his leadership to make a decision to say, on Christmas, <laughs> we're not going together for worship. If there's a day to have a special worship celebration, it'd be the day the man was born. But a pastor says, we're not, we're not doing that at, at my church. My own kids, I'm going to give you a little window into the Lambert home here, okay? <laughs> my own kids said, dad, tell us what you think. Really? Do you think attendance at church on Christmas is going to be higher or lower? What do you really think? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. No, 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 you're not allowed to do that. You have to tell us what you really think. And I said, well, listen, I could tell you a story where more people than normal come. And they go. <laughs> and I said, or I, I could tell you a story where the same number of people come. They're going. Mm. And I said, no, no, the same number could come because we'll have some people who skip out to do their other stuff. But then we're going to have some people who have visitors for, in from out of town. And so it'll compensate for the people who don't come. And they're like, mm-mm. And I said, or I could tell you a story where attendance will be low on Christmas. And they said, it's that one. <laughs> My own children, who will be here, <laughs> are concerned that they're going to be here with a lot less of you than normal. So everybody from pastors and pastor's kids is making this an issue. Are Christians going to worship on Christmas Day, are we going to replace the worship of the baby with turkey and fruitcake and brunch? Well, everybody gets to do what they want. Again, I'm not the Lord of anybody's life. I can't tell anybody what to do. But what I can do is if you're tempted to say Jesus is the reason for the season and not do what angels do when they see Jesus. What I can do is help you get a better view of what they see that you might not see. I, I want to look for just a few minutes with you at Luke chapter 2 and help you see what the angels see that lead them to worship. And if you can see what they see, I think you'll want to join them in their worship at the birth of Jesus. What is it that the angels are celebrating at Christmas? Well, the first thing we see is that at Christmas, we see a Savior who comes for lowly people. At Christmas, Jesus, our Savior, comes to lowly people. That's one of the things that the angels celebrate and worship. Verse 14 says, glory to God in the highest. This is what they shout and sing and proclaim. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. The angels announce that God at Christmas is coming to bring peace to the people with whom he is pleased. And the question we need to answer very clearly is, well, with whom is God pleased? Who gets the peace? And the best biblical answer that I have for you in light of this text is Jesus is pleased with you when you are humble and lowly. When you're humble and lowly, Jesus is pleased with you and you get his peace. 
you think about all the different places in Scripture where we read about the fact that God is pleased with humble and lowly people. In James chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Very clearly again, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 5. It says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In a place like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at what it says. Verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. If you want the peace of God, if you want the pleasure of God, you need to be a humble person. This passage, that's not just the larger teaching of Scripture, but it's the teaching of this passage when you see the people to whom Jesus' announcement of his birth comes. It doesn't come to just anybody. It comes to shepherds. We're told in the text that in the same region of Bethlehem, there were some shepherds staying out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. In the ancient world, the shepherds were not second-class citizens. That would have been a promotion to be a second-class citizen. At the time of the New Testament, shepherds were at the bottom of the barrel. They were regularly excluded from Jewish worship life because they were regularly in violation of the ceremonial law because they had to be around things that were unclean and they had to be doing things and touching things that were unclean. And they were often out in the fields when other people could be near the temple celebrating. They were outcasts in Jewish life. They were outcasts in other ways because since they were at the bottom of the barrel and since they were often out alone doing things, their testimony was not even included and acceptable in court. If a shepherd was your witness that you were innocent, you didn't have a witness because they were at the bottom of the barrel. It is beyond noteworthy that when the angels go looking for witnesses to the birth of Jesus, they go to shepherds, they go to outcasts, they go to people who weren't even included in the court system. Why? Because Jesus is coming to bring peace to lowly people. If you want the proof that Jesus has come for you, if you're feeling too low, if you're feeling too defeated, if you feel too much like an outcast, you're not any worse off than a shepherd. And those are the people who get the first announcement from the angels. Jesus comes for lowly people. It says, interestingly enough, the text in verse 10, the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Does that make you think that, well, maybe he didn't just come for lowly people. Maybe he came for great people too. I mean, yeah, he did come to the shepherds and they're lowly, but it says he came for all the people. Well, here's what you need to understand. What you need to understand is there are no great people. In human history and in human life, all of our greatness is a varnish. It's just a cover that conceals. 
We try as people to get a little bit of money and we can buy some things that make it look like we're great. We try as people to work hard and get a position that can elevate us a little bit and it can make us look like we are great. We can sound like we're great and act like we're great, but it's all a varnish. We are all, every single one of us, needy people. And if you want to know how needy you are, if you think, well, I don't, I don't feel very needy, I feel kind of important. I feel like I've got plenty of money and plenty of respect and I'm in charge at my company or I've got a lot of prestige at my work. I feel, I feel kind of like big stuff. How much of that that makes you feel so important do you get to keep when your heart stops beating? See, at the moment of your death, at, at, at the moment that your eyes close and close forever, you open up and awaken in eternity. And where is your position going to be then? Where is your money going to be then? Where are your accomplishments going to be then? You will be naked and exposed before the perfect living God. The text tells us that Jesus has been born in verse 11 to be a savior. Great people don't need to be saved. And so if you have a Savior, Jesus, who has been born and lives a perfect life and dies on the cross to pay the penalty that you can't pay, to rise from the grave to demonstrate that he's accomplished what you could not accomplish, you are in desperate need of a Savior, not because you're great, but because you're weak and needy. And so when the Bible says that Jesus has come to be for all the people. He's talking about all the people who are weak, all of the people who are needy, all of the people just like you and just like me, who if we don't have help, if we don't have powerful help from Christ, we'll die and we'll die forever. What the angels see, what the angels worship, is that Jesus has come for weak people. Jesus hasn't left you weak. Jesus hasn't left you needy. Christmas is a celebration of the great love of God who draws near to weak and lowly people like you and me and the angels who aren't even the recipients of his salvation worship over it. How much more should we worship when we're the broken people he came to save? They worship because at Christmas, Jesus comes to save lowly people, but that's not the only reason they worship. They also worship because at Christmas, Jesus comes as a lowly person. Jesus doesn't just come for lowly people, Jesus comes as a lowly person. Look at this, verse 12. Here's the sign. There's a savior who's been born, and here's the sign that you shepherds need to go looking for. A lot of babies in Bethlehem. How are you going to know when you find this baby who's been born? Something really strange, something really unique. Verse 12, here's the sign. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths. Wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Lying in a manger. I did a Google search this week, that most pristine of sermon research acts. I did a Google search about how much baby cribs cost. I did a Google search for what is the best baby crib. We've been out of the market on this for a little while. And there are some nice baby cribs out there. Listen, I was looking at one of them and I'm like, I kind of want to sleep in that. <laughs> but I just can't afford it. It's too expensive. I uh, did a Google search about baby blankets. And I, I came upon uh, Prince George's 
baby blanket. That's not just the name of a baby blanket. I mean, Prince George in England, the heir to the throne of Great Britain, there was this, when he was born, I don't know if you knew this or not, but a couple years ago when he was born and they walked out of the hospital holding the heir to the throne, a prince, he was wrapped in this blanket. I forget the name of it, but it was a couple hundred bucks. And it wasn't the only one. You know that. It wasn't the only one. And the, the blanket blew up. Everybody wanted to wrap their little baby's bottom and Prince George's couple hundred dollar blanket blew up. I haven't swaddled one of my own children in 12 years, but I was good at it. I was good at swaddling the kids. We had tight little baby burritos when, uh, <laughs> when back in my day when we were doing this. And you know what we did? We went to like Target and Walmart and we bought the packet of 12 that were like pink or blue. And we would come home and we'd wrap that baby up. It wasn't Prince George's blanket, but it wasn't cloth either. It wasn't rags. And when we laid our kids down, we didn't lay them in this crib that I kind of want for Christmas for me. But we laid them in a very safe crib that passed all the safety standards at the time. We certainly did not wrap them in rags and put them in a place where cows eat their dinner. But here is the Son of God, the King of heaven and earth, the King who became a king not first by being a prince, but is king by virtue of who he is. And he's wrapped in rags and laid in a manger. Jesus comes lowly. And here's the thing that's even more amazing. All of our greatness that we were talking about a moment ago, it's all a varnish. It's all pretend greatness. Our actual state is neediness. And we pretend to be great. But all of Jesus' lowliness is a varnish. Whereas our greatness covers up true neediness, Jesus' lowliness covers up true greatness. Intrinsic greatness, infinite worth. He is born as the Savior. He comes strong to save weak people. He's born in the city of David, the city of the great king over God's people. And he comes surrounded with angelic glory. That is strength. That is power. The great king of heaven and earth obscures his glory and his greatness with lowliness. Why? For you and for me. If Jesus had come great as he is, then only the pretend greats of the world would have an opportunity to step up and get close to him, and they wouldn't be able to get very far. But when Jesus comes humble and lowly and his human frame is wrapped up in rags and placed in a feeding trough, then anybody can come to him if they will humble themselves and appeal before his manger, humble and lowly. If you will humble yourself and say, I'm not great, and Jesus is, even when he looks lowly, he will receive you. A shepherd can get close to Jesus. You can get close to Jesus because Jesus comes humble and lowly for you. The angels see this and they shout glory. They respond in worship and praise when they don't have the same access we do. What ought we to do? How much worship ought to pour out of our heart when Jesus came lowly for us? And that gets to the third point. At Christmas, glory, worship, praise, and honor comes to the great Christ who comes lowly for lowly people. 
you want to see a great example of worship on the part of angels, you see them worship and praise in response to this great Christ coming for lowly people. Look at where's, what verse 14 says. Glory to God in the highest. What kind of glory are we going to give to God when the lowly people have a lowly Savior who is in himself great? What kind of glory comes at Christmas? Glory in the highest, the highest glory, the highest praise, the most exalted worship comes to God at Christmas. Why? Because he's giving peace on earth to lowly people. There are two themes that run through the Bible constantly. A couple of years ago, we did a sermon series, an overview of the Bible, and we talked about those two themes that always go through the Bible. We called it love and glory because those are two profound themes that you always see in Scripture. There is God's glory shot through the pages of Scripture where God is exalted and awesome and overwhelmingly so, and our mouths drop when we see Him as He really is. He's glorious and exalted and great. But we also see running through the Bible this theme of the great love of God. That God loves his people. God's motivation is not just his own glory. And God's motivation is not even simply loving people. God's motivation is to put those two things together. In the Bible, when God's glory is exalted... He is most typically loving lost and lowly people like you and me. And that's certainly what we see at Christmas. The angels give the highest glory to God because God has come to bring peace to lowly people. They have the good sense to worship. What about you? Do you see this? I mean, really? Do you see that you are a lowly person. You're, you're nobody special, and neither am I. Do you see it? Do you see your great need for a Savior? Do you see that if it's not for Christmas, you're dead in trespasses and sins forever? And do you see that at Christmas, the great Christ for whom angels shout, holy, 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 and glory to God in the highest. They look at him coming lowly for you, and they praise his name. What about you? Do you do that? Look at these words in verse 11. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you, a savior. Look at it again. In the city of David, there has been born for you. Oh, how I am praying that these words will stick in your heart. That as you drive home today, as you go Christmas shopping, as you plan your Christmas festivities, that you will hear over and over and over again in your heart that born for you is a Savior. All of your life and all of your joy and all of your hope is based not just on the existence of God, and not just that God would send his son to be born as a savior, but that God would send his son to be a savior for you. If you believe that, if you, if you make Christmas personal and you believe that Jesus has come for you, then you would never be tempted to replace worship at Christmas for fruitcake, for brunch, 
for sleeping in. You'll do what the shepherds do. They saw what the angels had the good sense to do, and they went at that moment to worship this Christ right on the day of his birth. And that's what we'll do. And our worship won't just be any kind of worship. It'll be the, it'll be the kind of worship that sings. In the 1700s, Charles Wesley wrote a famous song. The words that we sing today were, were actually written and made popular by George Whitfield, but it was, it was originally Charles Wesley's song. And it was a song that he wrote when he truly encountered the grace of Jesus. And he wrote, hark, the herald angels sing. It's kind of a weird phrase. When I was a little kid before I was saved, and actually probably for an embarrassingly long amount of time after I got saved, I thought hark was something we did to the herald. <laughs> There's a thing called a herald and you need to hark on it. And then also the angels sing. But if you know the way their grammar works, hark is an old term for listen. What are we listening to? We're listening to the herald angels. These angels come as heralds. Listen, the herald angels are singing glory to the newborn king. The angels have the sense to worship. And when we listen and when we see, we'll never trade Christmas for anything but an opportunity to join them in their worship. Because Christmas isn't just the reason for the season. Christmas is the reason for your life. You've got to worship. And you've got to sing. So let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, come to us. Help us to listen to the angels heralding the birth of Jesus. Help us to believe that a Savior has been born for us and believing to have the good sense to worship. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.